Chapter 19 of the Boy Scouts on the Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts on the Trail by Herbert Carter. Chapter 19 The Wine of a Bullet. Wow! And again I say, wow! broke out Giraffe, although rather feebly for the astounding admission made by Tad seemed to have almost taken his breath away. Fired on by the hobo burglars? gasped Bumpus. Sounds kind of interesting, Tad. Suppose you tell us more about it, suggested Step Hen, who, strange to say, appeared to treat the matter in a less serious vein than any of his companions. Sabattis had raised his head at hearing what the newcomer said, and was evidently taking note. Jim shut his teeth hard together, and assumed what he no doubtless believed to be his fighting face, and he certainly looked fierce enough, Bumpus thought, happening to glance that way. Well, let's have a bite to eat first, and after that's done with, I'll tell you all there is to the story, declared Tad, who was evidently some tired, as Giraffe liked to put it. Then there was a hustle, as everyone tried to do something about the fire so as to hurry things along, for it became evident that Tad was in no humor to talk until he had refreshed the inner man. Some of you fellers go back and sit down. There's quite too many cooks around here, and it hinders things more than it helps. Jim and me can get along faster if left alone. And with these words, Giraffe shooed Step Hen and Davy into the background. Presently, the coffee was boiling, and there was a scent of cooking food in the air. While the three returned hunters were munching their supper, the others hovered around. Seconds seemed like minutes to them, while the latter took on the shape of long hours. So impatient were the boys to hear what had happened but after a time Tad announced that he was satisfied, and assuming a comfortable attitude, he started in to talk, the others hanging on his every word, and frequently interrupting to ask questions when a certain point was not wholly understood. We tramped all morning, and never started any game worth bagging, he began. Of course there were partridges, and if we hadn't been out after deer, we might have brought in a good-sized bag of the birds. But you know how it is, when you've got your mind made up to have venison, these other things only annoy you. All the same, remarked Giraffe, partridges are mighty fine eatin', and I'm going to bring in a bunch some of these fine days, if Davy will loan me his gun. As yet nothing had been said about the bee tree or the black thief Giraffe had bagged, and the boy was holding the news back in order to spring it on the deer hunters, in order to show them that they were not the only ones who had met with an adventure since sunup that morning. At nooning, Tad went on to say, paying no attention to the interruption, for he knew the failings of Giraffe only too well, we stopped to eat our snack and figure out which way we wanted to tramp between then and night. Eli had his mind set on getting a deer, and all of us were willing to stay out until we had dropped one, even if it took all of tomorrow. Then, once more, we made a start changing our course and intending to cover a larger territory by making a big sweep and about three in the afternoon we managed to start up a nice fat young buck which fell to our rifles davy was seen making motions with his hands just at this juncture and the others had little difficulty in reading the signs to mean that in reality the said fat young buck had fallen to the rifle of the speaker or tad himself and if the others could claim any share in the glory it was small indeed we hung the prize up tad went on intending to come back for him a couple of hours later since eli had an idea we might scare up another deer in the country just beyond and davy was wild for a chance to try his buckshot cartridges on one but it wasn't any use broke in davy just then we just tramped and tramped till even eli said there didn't seem to be any more deer moving just then besides i complained of sore feet and i guess that was one reason why the others determined to turn back pick up our young buck and strike for home the place where we had left the deer was about seven miles from here down the wind tad continued and we just knew that with the tramp ahead carrying what we wanted of the deer it would take us a good time to get here but no matter we headed straight for the spot which eli had marked down in his mind as being the big tree to a limb of which we had hoisted our game on the way davy who had changed his shells knocked over a couple of partridges very neatly they are in one of those bundles there I only mention this fact because Eli believes that the discharge of the double-barrel gun had something to do with what followed. Pretty soon we came in sight of the big tree. At least it looked mighty like the one we meant to find, but we had to rub our eyes and look again, 
for do you know there wasn't any deer at all hanging there eli said he had made no mistake and davy was as sure as i was that it must be our tree all right just then one of us discovered that there was something lying at the foot of the tree that had the look of a deer and we hurried forward davy hadn't forgotten about the wolves we heard howling and was saying that they must have dragged the buck down in some way but eli knew better and that it could not be the work of any wolf that ever trotted on four legs then we came closer and saw a sight that made us furious tad went on a frown on his usually placid brow there was our lovely little buck all carved up as fine as you please and by one who knew just how to do the business too the best pieces had been carried away and we were left only what might have done for the foxes or wolves phew burst out the impulsive giraffe say that was enough to make anybody as mad as hops i can just see davy here jumping around like fun of course you looked for a trail didn't you tad that was the very first thing we did resumed the other and there wasn't any trouble about finding one either for eli said they had jumped off in such a big hurry he just knew they must have heard davy's shots and expected that we were coming back for our game well there wasn't any use crying over spilt milk boys but we were so much upset by our misfortune and so mad at those fellows that we just started off on their trail meaning to hold them up if only you overtook the bunch suggested bumpus who was listening with all eagerness his eyes round with interest oh well none of us hardly knew what we meant to do tad answered i rather guess our only thought just then was to try and recover the fine venison those two rascals had robbed us of then there wasn't three of them again asked giraffe quickly and tad smiled as he turned toward the tall scout saying i was just wondering whether any of you would notice that when i said it but the fact is there were only a pair of them and eli's about to come to the conclusion the third man must be sick or badly wounded well we did start off at a hot pace eli of course doing most of the trailing but just hold on there tad interrupted davy jones you know well enough that three separate times you found the tracks when eli had lost the trail and didn't he say prompt enough that for a boy you certainly did show a heap of smartness i think we must have followed that trail about a mile tad went on giving davy a smile for his compliment and it was beginning to get dusk a little when all of a sudden a gun banged away somewhere ahead and we heard the whine of a bullet passing over close above our heads say and again davy broke in to express his own individual feelings in the matter none of you fellers ever was shot at and i just guess now you can't understand the queer feeling it gives you i felt like the pit of my stomach had kind of caved in and there was a gnawing just like you have when you're awful hungry and when tad says that that there bullet whined over our heads he hits the mark all right for that's what it sounded like i dropped flat on my face in the scrub and lay as still as a possum playing dead we all dodged some i imagine remarked tad with a smile at davy's words i know i found myself behind a tree in pretty short order eli began to creep up and it seemed rather exciting about that time even davy and myself started to advance and pretty soon there was eli calling to us to come on because there was no longer any danger for the birds had flown skipped out just like that and davy snapped his fingers contemptuously all the while we kept laying low and trying to see if we could glimpse anything to bang away at it was bad luck well tad resumed his story by saying with the night at hand and the two venison thieves a good half mile away by that time even eli saw that it was useless trying to overhaul him so we concluded to make our way back to where our buck had lain take what we could get of the remains and then start by slow stages for the cabin here but we had little to say on the way for it seemed more like a funeral procession than the return of a victorious hunting party and i'll own up i was pretty nigh tuckered out admitted davy that's one reason why eli and tad decided to come along home been limping the better part of the way and i guess i've got a stone bruise on my heel that don't feel any too fine but i'll be all right tomorrow, fellers and then just see what we do to them that would take the bread away from your mouth if they had the chance the others looked to tad as though what davy had just said gave them a cue is that the game to go back there in the morning and take up the trail asked giraffe excitedly this here seems to be the real thing all wool and a yard wide muttered bumpus and then brightening up he continued with increasing earnestness and then if we should find a chance to capture those slippery rascals 
Just think what we could do with all the nice money that's offered for their apprehension. Didn't our friend the sheriff say it was a whole thousand and might be twice that by now? Count me in, Tad. I want you to know if we're going to round up these bank burglars. You may wonder why I'm so fierce about it, but you forget that my dad is the president of our bank at Cranford, and who knows but what it might have been that institution these hobos looted. I've got a personal interest in this matter, and I ain't going to be left out of any deal either. Just remember that. End of chapter 19chapter twenty of the boy scouts on the trail this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by debbie baker robinson the boy scouts on the trail by herbert carter chapter twenty a wonderful find do you really think they meant to shoot you tad asked step hen after the fat boy had quieted down somewhat We've been talking that over, the patrol leader replied, and come to the conclusion that the shot was only meant as a warning for us to draw up and haul off, to tell us that they were desperate men and would not stand for any nonsense from a hunting party. But that bullet did whine, I tell you fellers, declared Davy emphatically. No other word would explain just how it sounded when she went zipping past, so close to our heads that we all ducked without thinking. And like as not, remarked Allen, who thus far had taken no part in the discussion, if we start taking up their trail in the morning and come anywhere close to our birds, we'll apt to more than hear the whine of a bullet. They're bad men, Sheriff Green told us, and if put in a hole with a chance of spending some years in prison, wouldn't mind wounding a few of us, perhaps worse than that even. Tad looked serious. I've been considering that matter he announced, and trying to make up my mind just what a party of Boy Scouts caught in such a puzzle ought to do. If our real scout master, Dr. Philander Hobbs, was only here, that would be a question for him to decide. I wish we had him along with us right now. And the rest of us are mighty glad business kept him tied down at home, just at the time we had this great chance to come up into the main woods, chuckled Step Hen. You're as able to settle anything as well as Dr. Philander, declared Allen. And so, please let us know what came of your thinking this subject over, because we all know you too well, Tad, to believe you'd ever drop it without hatching some sort of a scheme. That's the ticket we all want to know, echoed Bumpus. Of course, this sort of talk must have been exceedingly pleasant to the young patrol leader. He would not have been a boy had he not been thrilled by the showing of confidence which his chums placed in his ability as a manager and scoutmaster and so he hastened to oblige the eager demands of the others. While we were tramping along homeward, Tad continued, I got to figuring how best we ought to act. You see, somehow the, that thing of chasing after those toughs didn't appeal to me very much, after hearing how a lump of lead can sound when it's passing by so close to your head. And in the end, I had an idea. If you think it's worth anything, why, we might try the same out. Sure we will, declared Giraffe. And we know it's the right stuff, even before you start in to explain, Step Hen volunteered. Don't be too sure of that, laughed Tad. But here's the scheme, boys, and let's hear what you think of it. Now, in the morning sometime, we'll just pack up and start along with our paddles, as if we meant to keep it going through the whole blessed day. But that'll only be a big bluff, you understand. Because, when we've got about a mile or so above here, and the coast seems clear, why, we can land, hide our stuff, perhaps leaving one to guard the same, perhaps, and the rest put back to the cabin here. Wow, that's the thing, exclaimed Giraffe. I get the idea, Tad. You expect we'll hide in here and gobble the gentlemen up as soon as they come along. Ain't that what you mean now? Not quite, said Tad. It might answer just as well in case when we got back here we could uh, be sure they haven't arrived before us and we're already quartered in the cabin. But if that proved to be the case, why, we'd set to work and try to surprise Charlie Barnes and his pals. You see, whatever we do, we want to keep in the background till we're just ready to spring our trap, and in that way prevent them from doing us any bodily harm. I'm in charge of the patrol, and I'd feel pretty bad now if on going home I had to show up with a bunch of cripples on my hands. That's what keeps me guessing and trying to accomplish things without taking too much risk. It's a good scheme, all right commented Step Hen. That's what I say, too, added Bumpus. 
davy allen and giraffe also declared that they liked the plan immensely and even eli crooks grinned jim nodded his head in appreciation while sabattis smoked on and watched tad admiringly out of the corner of his black eye as if he had never before run across such a smart lad and wondered what it meant but of course tad went on to say the success of such a plan depends altogether on one thing to begin with you mean whether they're bound to come to the cabin here asked allen that's it the scout leader went on calmly i thought that all over carefully and decided that judging from the actions of that man looking in here as well as their hanging around the vicinity when they had ought to be well on the way to the canadian border that there must be some sort of unusual attraction about this same old cabin for those rascals go on tad we're catching on to what you've got in mind hinted allan we happen to know said tad that this chief hobo who calls himself charlie barnes now though he may have gone by another name years back must have been a main guide once on a time if so he is well acquainted up in this region and must know all about this abandoned cabin now if so be the third chap is sick or badly hurt as we've guessed why where could they find a better place to stay for a while than right here seems like it admitted giraffe and say perhaps that's just why they cribbed your venison like they did if they expect to hole up here for some weeks lying low while the sheriff and his posse go chasing all over the country looking for the runaways why they'd need a heap of grub and so they just couldn't resist the temptation to grab your little buck it supplied their wants for a long time if they only jerked the meat the way the indians do and made it into pemmican glad to see you take that view of the matter giraffe tad continued for it was always an object with him as a leader of the patrol to tempt his scouts to think for themselves and not depend wholly on others to plan things but tad remarked allan about that time he had been watching the face of the other for signs that would tell him what tad had on his mind was this the only thing you stirred up that would be apt to keep these fellows wanting to get in this cabin so badly well honest now allan replied the other smilingly it wasn't i figured along another line too i said to myself that supposing now a year or so ago the same hard case of a charlie barnes had made another haul and escaped to the woods with his plunder where would he be apt to hide that same until the time when he could add to the pile and then skip across the border and boys i thought that this deserted old cabin would offer him about as snug a hiding place for his loot as any place i knew oh tad do you really think that exclaimed bumpus a smile appearing on his plump face just imagine us digging up treasure fellers would you gold and jewels and all sorts of precious things that these desperate yeggs have hooked in their bold operations and when we restored the same to the original owners how they'd pour the fat rewards into our pockets why we'd just as like as not have our names in all the papers down in new york and be famous hold on said tad you make me think of the girl who was tripping to market with a basket of eggs and saying to herself that after she sold those she'd buy a pig and when he grew up she'd take that money and buy a calf and then after that grew up to be a cow with the money she'd get from selling all the milk she could lay a nice sum by so that when the right young man came along she'd have enough to get her outfit with and then she tripped once too often fell over and every egg was broken broke in bumpkiss with a shout sure i've heard my mother tell that story it means we oughtn't ought to figure too far ahead but tad i want to say i like your scheme and in the morning we ought to turn this here old place upside down hunting in every nook and cranny for the hobo's plunder not forgetting that loft up yonder where our friend the bear began giraffe and suddenly broke off with a laugh as he remembered that in the other excitement he had forgotten all about his private surprise he immediately went and picked up the bearskin and held it up before the admiring eyes of tad and davy who immediately started to ask innumerable questions the story was by degrees told and the latecomers allowed to taste the beautiful honey tad declared he had noticed that bumpus and giraffe looked a little swollen about the head but other things had kept him from asking the reason up to now the hour was growing pretty late but strange to say none of the scouts seemed to feel sleepy but bumpus who nodded occasionally as he sat there trying to listen to the conversation that passed among his mates tad had meanwhile been using his eyes to some advantage he noticed that the stones about the hearth were rather large and to his mind one of them had the appearance of having been recently disturbed suddenly getting up as the fire burned low and afforded him an opportunity to come near without being scorched 
Tad worked away for a minute or so, trying to insert his fingers under this certain hearthstone. Here, try this for a lever, Tad, remarked Allen, handing him a thick, short stick. For somehow, he had quickly guessed what the other had in his mind, and was naturally intensely interested in the result. So Tad, by inserting this under the stone, was enabled to raise it up. Breathlessly, the others leaned forward to watch the result, for by now, of course, even the aroused Bumpus had guessed what Tad was doing. The patrol leader seemed to be fumbling around in some sort of little cavity he had found under the hearthstone. Then, with an exclamation, he drew some object into view and laid it on the floor. It seemed to be a bundle of old clothes, but when Tad, with eager hands, had unrolled these, the scouts held their very breath at the sight that met their astonished eyes. Tad had figured it all out, and now they understood just why that leader of the Yeggmen was so determined to get into the old abandoned cabin in the woods. He had hidden the proceeds of other robberies there, and wished to take it all along with him when he crossed over into a safe asylum in Canada. End of chapter 20 Recording by Debbie Baker Robinson Chapter 21 of The Boy Scouts on the Trail This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie Baker Robinson The Boy Scouts on the Trail by Herbert Carter Chapter 21 The Dummy Packet Bumpus dug his knuckles into his eyes and then stared again at the pile of plunder which had evidently been taken from some bank, for besides the little rolls that seemed to contain gold eagles and half eagles and fives, there were a number of packages of bank bills and a lot of bonds. At least, that's what the boys guessed they must be. Somebody please give me a pinch, said Bumpus. I sure must be dreaming one of my old dreams about finding buried treasure. Hey, not so hard, Step Hen. I'm awake now all right, because that hurt like the dickens. But just look at what Tad's unearthed, would you? Whew. I don't blame that feller for hanging around here. I'd refuse to be chased away, too, if I had all that stuff lying under a stone in an old cabin. For some little time, the boys continued to talk. Alan had wisely in the beginning stepped over and hung something over the one little window of the cabin. He seemed to understand that, with the finding of this stolen plunder belonging to a bank that had been looted at some previous day, they had taken up issues with these desperate men. And whether they wanted to or not, from this time forward, it must be a question as to whether the hobo thieves recovered their prize, or were in turn taken prisoner by the scouts and the guides with them. By unearthing this rich haul, Tad had settled the question. They could no longer hold aloof and sit on the fence, but must enter into the game with the yeggmen. And so the plan suggested, which looked to the ultimate capture of the rascals, appealed to the boys more than ever. If circumstances over which they seemed to really have little control forced them to take a hand in the matter, it was the part of wisdom that they get in the first blow, and not wait for the desperate fugitives of the main woods to attack them in order to try and force them to hand over this rich find. How'd it do to make up a dummy bundle with these same old clothes? remarked Giraffe. We could fasten it with a string, same as they had it, and in case the fellers didn't take the trouble to open the same, why, would be that much ahead, you see. That's a good idea, and can do no harm to try, remarked the patrol leader, who was only too pleased to receive suggestions from the scouts, even though at times they thought of plans that were wildly impracticable, for it showed their minds were working, and anything was better than that they fall into the state of letting someone else do their thinking for them. So Giraffe was set to work constructing the imitation bundle. Of course, it did not contain one blessed thing worth mentioning. Bumpus wrote the single suggestive word fooled on a piece of paper and wanted them to insert that, but Tad remarked that it would be better not to further arouse the anger of such lawless men. This was no child's play in which they were now engaged, but the most serious adventure of all they had ever run across, and must be treated with the sober consideration grown-up men would be apt to give to such a matter. But even this rebuff could not quench the newly aroused spirit in the stout boy Bumpus, who saw his dreams coming true. He could imagine the wonderful results when they delivered these valuable bonds over to the bank that had been looted. Surely there must have been a generous reward offered for their return, which, with what they were certain to receive for capturing the hobo thieves, would cram the treasury of the Boy Scout troop, 
and open up many delightful chances for other vacation trips to far away places but what will we do with all this glorious stuff he asked as they sat and looked and talked while the night wore on i'm going to make it up into a packet somehow remarked ted then when i've got it in as small a compass as possible i'll wind a cord around it every which way and use a little piece of red sealing wax i remember seeing in my haversack to seal it up with then nobody can break it open without our knowing it my goodness i hope now tad you don't think any scout would be so pokey as to want to meddle with it after you've taken it in charge remarked step hen certainly i don't replied the patrol leader quickly i know you all too well for that but i believe there's a certain amount of red tape to be carried out in a case like this and i'm going to fasten it in the presence of every one of you so that you can hold up your right hands and vow if ever you are asked that everything we found is sealed in this package and here goes for a tough job considering that he had little material to work with it was a hard task but then tad possessed considerable ingenuity and could adapt himself to circumstances wonderfully well and the result was all that could be asked since the package he produced was not very large but quite compact and after being liberally daubed with the red sealing wax so that none of the cords could be undone really looked very important indeed there how will that do boys asked tad when he had finished simply great declared giraffe and it's a wonder how you manage to get such big results from small things i never saw the like i was thinking mused allan that since charlie barnes came here only last night what is to hinder him from paying us a visit again that's so ejaculated giraffe say maybe that's why sabattis went out a long time back he's a sly one now let me tell you chances are he expects that we may have uninvited company some time around now and if the wandering willie tries to peep in at our window like he did last time why he's going to run up against sabattis good and hard i knew that's why he went out ted observed and it gave me a comforting feeling because i'm as sure as anything can be that nobody could steal up here on us with the indian on guard not much added step hen he's got the ears of a fox and can hear the least sound of a weasel you mean bumpus declared i never turn over in my sleep but what if i raised my head there's them black eyes of sabattis watching me just as if he expected i was going to have a fit like davy here used to take forget that won't you bumpus said the other hastily i reckon i'm cured of that caper by now but sometimes he added as he saw giraffe looking at him and grinning i do feel signs like one was a comin on again though it never really and truly does you see now where will you put that tad asked step hen pointing to the sealed package that had been so officiously done up oh keep it out of sight under my blanket till morning answered the other then we could hide it in one of the canoes under the duffel where it'll be safe we want you to take it in your boat remember that observed giraffe you was the one to find the prize and the only claim that any of the rest have to the reward will be that we stood ready to defend it tad looked squarely at him as giraffe said this that'll do for you giraffe he remarked sternly i don't want to hear any more like that there are six of us here and two more at home every scout will have an equal share in any reward that may happen to come to us yes and more than that the other five who are on this expedition with me are going to be credited with their portion of the honor of recovering this lost bank capital we're in the same boat sink or swim survive or perish understand that fellows and now after this i'll take it hard of you if any member of the silver fox patrol tries to shove more than a sixth of the glory on my shoulders they saw he meant it and their boyish hearts warmed within them at the knowledge that they had such a splendid chum at the head of the patrol where could another like tad brewster be found they would like to know the dummy package was placed carefully under the hearthstone and tad tried the best he knew how to arrange it just about as he had found the treasure trove and as one of them had said if the hoboes in their hurry failed to open it up they might remain in ignorance concerning their great loss for some length of time now i think that it must be nearly midnight announced tad and a lot of us are dead tired so i put it up to you fellows if we hadn't ought to try and get some rest we want to be in trim for other work tomorrow giraffe held up his hand count me in he remarked wearily ditto here said allan also making the high sign can't crawl under my blanket any too soon to please me davy added well if the rest of you want to turn in i'm there step hen declared yawning 
All eyes were fastened on Bumpus, waiting to hear his decision so that it might be made unanimous. Great Scott, he's dead asleep and sitting up at that, exclaimed Giraffe, which was a fact, for the fat boy had been so completely tired out with his labor of the morning than securing the store of honey, as well as from the excitement and nervous shock brought on by the bee stings, that he could not keep his eyes open any longer, and sitting there like a heathen god, as Giraffe called it, he had gone fast asleep. Of course, they had to wake poor Bumpus up so that he could take his shoes off and get ready to crawl under his blanket, but he started to perform these little tasks grumblingly because he had been disturbed. Might let a feller snooze where he was, he muttered, working away with his eyes still closed. I was just going to sit down to the dinner table at home, and it was Thanksgiving Day, too. Um, hmm, how that big turkey did make me crazy to get at it. And then comes a budge in the ribs and giraffe here saying as how I'm taking all the room and must roll over. A feller never can be let alone when he wants to, and this... Bumpus did not finish what he was saying, nor was he longer sitting there with his eyes closed, groping at the fastening of his leggings in the endeavor to get the shin protectors off. On the contrary, he started halfway to his feet, once more wide awake. For without the slightest warning, there came to the ears of the scouts the loud report of a rifle from some point just outside the cabin walls. And they suddenly remembered what had been said only a short time before about the dangerous yeggmen coming back again on this night, and also that Sabattis was on guard. End of chapter 21「twenty two of the Boy Scouts on the Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts on the Trail by Herbert Carter. Chapter 22. The Night Alarm. What did I do with my gun? cried Giraffe, darting around this way and that, as he tried to remember in which corner he had stacked his rifle after coming in earlier in the night from the bear hunt. Already had Tad, Allen, and Davy snatched up their weapons and made a bolt for the door, following the lead of Jim and Eli, and wildly excited by the possibilities of finding that something of a tragic nature had been occurring without. Poor Bumpus, having no gun of his own, looked around in despair. He certainly did not want to be left behind when all this turmoil was going on, nor was he desirous of rushing out without some sort of means of defending himself in case he was set upon by enemies. So he hastened to snatch up the same stout stick which had enabled Tad to pry loose the heavy hearthstone, and swinging this vigorously, Bumpus trotted after the other scouts, dragging his half-unfastened leggings along with him as he went. It was dark outside, for the young moon had gone to rest long before. But then Tad, with his customary wisdom, had remembered this, and as he went out, he snatched up the only lantern they had brought along. Bumpus could hear them all making for one point, and he followed suit. Eli and Jim had been able to locate the quarter from whence that single shot had come, and were now heading for it. At any rate, there had been no succeeding shots, no bombardment of the cabin, and Tad, thinking it wise to have some light on the subject, stopped for a few seconds to scratch a match and apply the flame to the wick of the lantern after which he again hastened on. By that time the others had gone ahead, but his short delay served one good turn, since it enabled poor puffing Bumpus to reach the side of the patrol leader, which in fact, no doubt, gave the fat boy considerable gratification. What is it, Tad? Bumpus managed to gasp as they hurried along. I don't know myself, came the reply, but we'll soon find out now, because I hear them talking just ahead. And that's Sabattis, too, declared Bumpus in a relieved tone just as though he may have been worrying over the possibility of the Indian having been injured when that gun was discharged. Of course it is, Tad said, and I never thought it was anyone else but him who fired that shot. He must have believed he saw a suspicious figure making up through the brush or trying to damage our boats, though why these men should want to do that when they're hoping for us to clear out surprises me. They were now close on the rest of the party. Indeed, by the light which the lantern gave, they could make the group out all of the others being clustered around the Indian guide who was talking in his usual short sentence way. Hear sound. See something move. Shoot. That comprised the whole business with Sabattis, where a white man would have described how he was thrilled to locate the suspicious noise and tell what his feelings were as he drew up his gun and blazed away. The Penobscot Indian simply gave the bare facts. He came, he heard, he fired. 
You don't think now it could have been one of those wolves we heard yelping last night, do you, Sabattis? Giraffe ventured to ask, more to draw the other out than because he himself believed any such thing. Huh, when wolf speak, does he swear hard? asked Sabattis quaintly. Oh, then he must have been a man, because so far animals haven't learned how to use hard language, admitted Giraffe, doubtless chuckling at the success that had followed his little plan. He must have been pretty mad because you blocked his plans to use hard words like that, ventured Davy. Hurt, declared the guide. He means that he thinks he wounded the fellow, explained Tad. Well, what else could he expect to come nosing around our camp like that, and even taking a sly shot at our hunters after stealing their nice buck, demanded Bumpus, who could not be accused of acting as though he were sleepy now. Where were they when you heard them first, Sabattis? asked Tad, wishing to get all the information possible. Round here, maybe. Hear talk and whisper like, and know two men come. Then fire just one shot. That all. They make off in a hurry. Quick! Let's see if we can find their tracks, suggested Step Hen. But before he spoke, Tad was already circling around, holding the lantern close to the ground, and carefully looking to see if there could be found any signs telling that the Indian had not made a mistake. I hope they won't think to take a pot shot at the lot of us while we stand around here, said Giraffe uneasily. You needn't worry, spoke up Bumpus. A sharpshooter couldn't hit you because you ain't wide enough to make a shadow. Think of me and what dreadful chances I'm taking all the time. They could get me by shooting with their eyes shut. But all the same, you don't hear me whine. I'm ready to take my medicine without showing the white feather. What's that over there? Looks like a man kneeling down and aiming a gun, called out Step Hen just then. And forgetting the boast that was still on his lips, Bumpus threw himself on the ground and started to crawl behind a clump of thick bushes. It's only a stump after all, announced Tad, throwing the light of his lantern in the direction of the suspicious object. Get up, Bumpus, the coast is clear, said Giraffe sneeringly. These old leggings keep getting under my feet the worst kind, remarked Bumpus complacently, as though a poor excuse might be better than none. But see there, the Indians found something or other. Just as like as not, it's them tracks we're all looking for. Just what it is, added Davy Jones eagerly. As scouts who yearn to learn the many interesting things connected with woodcraft, it can be set down as certain that Step Hen and his comrades gathered about Sabattis and Tad, then and there, convinced that something was coming worthwhile. Just as Sabattis told us, there were two of them, Tad was saying, while he bent down to see the imprint of footgear at closer range. Seems to be something familiar about one of them tracks, Tad, remarked Giraffe. Yes, our old friend, the patched shoe, has turned up again, chuckled the patrol leader, pointing to the plain, unmistakable sign across the toe of the impression of the shoe. Which, of course, means that Charlie is doing it again, Step Hen remarked. He wants to be in every mix-up, seems like. But if here are two, where is the other feller? You know, we decided that he must be sick or something like that, Alan pursued. They were coming straight at the cabin when our guard turned them around and sent them flying, Giraffe put in. That looks like they wanted to see if we've disturbed that stuff any. I guess they're getting rather nervous about our hanging out here so long. It sort of interferes with their plans, perhaps. Well, Alan observed dryly, they'll see us getting out of here tomorrow if they keep their eyes open, which we hope will be the case. And then perhaps this Charlie Barnes and his two cronies will think they're safe in entering the old cabin. And putting up at the woods tavern for a time, feeding off our nice venison to beat the band, rumbled Giraffe who never could forgive the hobo outfit for depriving the scouts of that young buck. I wonder now, piped up Bumpus, if the chief means to start in tracking these two men tonight. He's thrown a good scare into them, seems, and they're running yet, I just reckon. But he gave them back the shot they fired at Tad and Eli and Davy here. That's the way we pay back our debts. All good scouts are supposed to settle when they owe anything, ain't they? What's Tad doing now, I wonder? What do you take us for, Bumpus? demanded Giraffe. Don't you understand that Tad said he wanted us to do things with as little risk as we could? And then to think we'd try to follow up these hard cases, holding a lantern just to ask them to bang away at us as much as they please. We ain't that green. The other plan promises to work best, and you see if Tad don't stick by it. Well, said the fat boy plaintively, how was I to know what they'd expect to be doing? And when you're puzzled what to think, ain't it policy to just hold off and fight for wind? That's what I was a-doing when I said that. But Tad is looking for something again, because he's moving off with the lantern. 
not wishing to be left in the dark all the others followed tad and sabattis both of whom seemed to be searching industriously along the ground as if they had lost something which was worth looking for perhaps they got a notion one of them fellers might have dropped something suggested step hen himself unable to grasp the true meaning of the strange actions of the two ahead you're closer to it than you think was the puzzling remark of allen while old eli and young jim seemed too amused by the remark and while they all watched and speculated each according to his light they saw sabattis come to a pause he called to tad whose back happened to be turned at the moment and the patrol leader hastened to join him sabattis was pointing down at his feet the boys noticed that there was something rather dramatic about his attitude while doing this and giraffe voiced the feelings of his mates when he said he found what he was looking for believe me and what do you suppose it can be the scouts pushed forward just as tad was doing so allen step hen davy giraffe yes and even bumpus as curious as the rest craned their necks forward and stared at the object in plain view beyond the tip of the dark finger which sabattis had extended there was a plain imprint of a shoe there though not the one that bore the mark across the sole and there was something more than this for when tad touched what seemed to be a dark little pebble with the point of a stick he had picked up they realized what it was a drop of blood showing that sabattis had made no mistake when he declared his random shot had at least slightly wounded one of the prowling hoboes end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the boy scouts on the trail this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by debbie baker robinson the boy scouts on the trail by herbert carter chapter twenty three a flank movement i should say sabattis did hit something declared giraffe staring hard at the tell-tale spot in the footprint but it wasn't charlie that got hurt remarked davy evidently alive to the fact that the track which showed the trace of blood did not have any cross line showing where the sole had been patched no it was the other fellow observed tad where was he hit sabattis left leg not much but bleed heap and the indian pointed to several other significant spots as he moved along the trail now how under the sun could he tell it was the left leg asked step hen evidently deeply puzzled to account for the positive manner in which the guide made this assertion oh that would be easy enough remarked the patrol leader just stop and you'll remember that each foot makes a different track this one is the left foot and now you'll be quick to think even if you don't say it that perhaps that drop could have fallen from the right foot as it was raised into the track of the left foot sabattis has other ways to prove what he says show them chief won't you because they want to learn all they can huh look this way see how replied the dark-faced guide leading the several eager scouts to where he knew an extra plain print of the foot in question might be found then he pointed out the difference between the mark of the right from the left foot and showed them that there was a heavier trail where that same right shoe happened to be planted you understand remarked tad who was following all this with considerable interest himself for he too had more or less to learn seems to me he means that if a feller happened to get hurt sudden like in his left leg he'd begin to limp giraffe spoke up eagerly and when he limped step hen went on to add it stands to reason the print of the foot on the leg he wanted to favor wouldn't be near so plain as the other why ain't that the easiest thing you ever heard tell of sure it is davy jones insinuated and after columbus showed those spanish grandees how to stand an egg up on end by punching the top down on the table why didn't they think that was the silliest thing ever oh it's just as simple as turning over your hand after another feller has been and told you how all the same it is easy ted went on to say and next time perhaps some of you will be able to figure things out yourselves that's what scouts ought to do every time that's the best part of the boy scout movement general baden powell says it makes boys stop depending on other people when they can just as well look out for themselves will these hoboes haul off now do you expect tad and give the cabin a wide berth asked bumpus well it begins to look as though they ought to steer clear of it as long as we're in possession the patrol leader replied still you can never tell 
By now they must be feeling pretty ugly toward us, and when such men have a grudge pushing them on, it's hard to say what they wouldn't do. Catch me a going to sleep then, remarked Bumpus, but even while he was making this brave remark with one of his hands, he was trying to suppress a great yawn. Oh, I don't suppose there will be as much danger as that, Tad continued, not wishing to alarm his chums unnecessarily. The guides will divide up the balance of the night into three watches. And if we like, one of us can keep company. In fact, he went on in haste, fearing that Bumpus might, in the goodness of his heart, volunteer his services, which it would be hard to decline. I'll appoint Alan here as one of the assistants to help out Jim, while Giraffe can stay up with Eli, and I'll share the watch of Sabattis, because I want to have a little whispered talk with him as we sit alone. So it was arranged. Bumpus made out to feel a little hurt that he had been overlooked in the distribution, but Davy showed him that both he and Step Hen were in the same boat. Besides, he added as a clincher, you know you haven't got any gun, Bumpus, and don't know much about firearms anyway. Don't you forget it, remarked the stout scout earnestly. I'm just determined to know more about him right along after this. The Boy Scouts may stand for peace all right, but I can see right now that the feller that's able to look out for himself is just the one that never gets trampled on. Be prepared to defend yourself, and chances are you'll never be called on to do a blessed thing. Oh, I'm on to a few dodges. I ain't so much asleep as some of you think. Wait till we go off on our trip across the continent with the money we're going to rake in for recovering the stuff and capturing the thieves. Maybe I'll show you a thing or two then. He's got a program all laid out, I do believe, ventured Step Hen, afterward to Giraffe, and expects to take lessons in shooting and all sorts of stunts once we get back to Cranford. But it'll be the making of Bumpus if he does wake up and do all kinds of things. He'll quit being so fat then and make muscle instead, and for one, I hope he carries it out. The entire party went back to the cabin. Here, arrangements for the balance of the night were concluded, and the first pair sent out to take their places as sentries. Bumpus had declared that he would not sleep a wink, but once he lay down, he really knew nothing more until he felt someone tugging at his sleeve. Is it my turn to be on guard? All right, I'll be up right away, he exclaimed, and then began to sniff the air. Say, what's all this mean? Are you going to eat breakfast in the middle of the night? Go over to the door and look out, laughed Tad. You'll think it's still funnier to see the silly old son poking his face up at such a time, but he's gone and done it all the same. Blessed if I ain't slept the whole night, muttered Bumpus, not knowing whether to be pleased because he had obtained such a refreshing sleep, or miffed on account of having been neglected when there was a call for all brave men and true. Finally, he concluded that what was done could not be undone, and besides, that venison did smell mighty appetizing. So he folded up his blanket and went outdoors to chase the last remnant of drowsiness from his eyes by a dash of icy water. There was no haste, for they did not mean to leave their present comfortable quarters until about the middle of the morning. This had been decided on as the best policy to be pursued, since they hoped that their actions would be observed by those in whom they were so deeply interested. By degrees, they started to pack their belongings and stow them away in their regular places, for each canoe had its own complement, the object being to divide the many things besides tents which they carried so that the boats might be about equally loaded. It is no easy task to paddle a heavily charged canoe up against a strong current hour after hour. Muscles hardened by constant use are needed to accomplish such a feat successfully without great fatigue. The scouts knew this now if they had not been so wise before for at sundry times each of them had been given opportunities to wield the spruce paddle and battle with the swift current. It was in the neighborhood of ten o'clock that the last thing was stowed, and after looking all around to make sure that nothing had been forgotten, the patrol leader gave the signal to depart. Bumpus did not have his bugle along on this expedition. He had wanted to carry it, being a clever musician, and quite fond of practicing the many fine calls whereby scouts may regulate their going to bed, rising in the morning, assembling for meals and other things. But Tad and Alan had shown him the folly of sounding a bugle in the main woods, where, as hunters, they were expected to keep as still as possible, so that the big game they hoped to secure might not take the alarm and flee wildly from the vicinity of such weird sounds. But Bumpus, not to be entirely undone, placed his hand to his mouth and managed to give a pretty good imitation of the bugle call, though he subsided suddenly when he saw the patrol leader frowning at him. So they left the spot where so many interesting as well as exciting events had come to visit them, and they carried away quite a few things besides the memories that would always haunt them. 
There was the honey, for instance, fastened up in every possible receptacle that could hold it securely. Then they had some bear meat that would do to chop up into hash, the fine skin that Giraffe meant to have made into a rug for the floor of his den at home, and last, but far from least, that precious packet so carefully tied up and sealed, containing the plunder which some bank must have lost a year or more back. This, of course, had been carefully hidden, so that even though the hoboes were secretly watching the departure, they could hardly guess that the scouts were carrying off their ill-gotten loot. Gaily they paddled against the current. Although they were warned not to seem to stare around in too curious a fashion, most of the boys were really watching the shore as they bucked up against the stream. And a short time after they had quite lost sight of the cabin and landing, Giraffe quietly informed Tad, who was close by, that he was pretty positive he had seen a man peering out at them from a clump of bushes along the river bank. He had not mentioned the fact at the time, because he said he was afraid one of the tenderfeet, meaning possibly Bumpus and Step Hen, might betray themselves by appearing too curious, and thus bring a shot from the shore. On they pushed until fully a mile had been covered. Tad allowed the boys to emit an occasional shout, meaning that it should be carried back to the ears of the man on the shore, and by gradually growing fainter and fainter, convince him that the party had really gone for good. There's the very place where we want to land, said Tad, after a little more time had elapsed. Plenty of rushes growing along the bank where we can hide the canoes and leave two to guard them, which will be Jim and Bumpus here. The rest of us ought to be enough to do the business if we manage to surprise the hobo crowd. Hearing what his fate was to be, Bumpus groaned. But remembering what a scout must promise to do when given an order by one in authority, he shut his teeth hard and doubtless determined that the next time he would have a gun, and then they must consider that he had rights as well as the remainder of the party. Once in the rushes, the landing was made. It proved to be a splendid place for slipping away without showing themselves, for the woods grew unusually thick just alongside, and the sun happened to be hidden by clouds at the time, which was near noon. And this was the way Tad led his company back toward the lone cabin, with himself and Sabattis in the lead, then Davy and Giraffe, and old Eli in conjunction with Stephen, and Allen bringing up the rear, seven in all. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 of the Boy Scouts on the Trail This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts on the Trail by Herbert Carter. Chapter 24. What Woodcraft Does. After leaving the spot where they had drawn the three canoes into the rushes, the little party started through the woods. Bumpus was very much grieved to see the balance of the scouts go off without him. He did not say anything, but his rosy, fat face was eloquent enough, as he nodded and turned to each one of his chums. Poor old Bumpus, said Giraffe to Davy in a whisper. He feels badly cut up at not getting a chance to earn that reward he's had on his mind so long. And you mark me, the first opening Bumpus gets, he'll be buying a gun all right. He doesn't like to be left out of the fun. As a rule, they were supposed to keep absolute silence, and Giraffe knew this, as did Davy. Hence, the other only nodded in reply, and taking his cue from this, the long-legged scout relapsed into quiet again. But Giraffe was wide awake. He meant to observe every little thing that took place around him. With two such veteran guides as old Eli and the Indian, doubtless there would be more or less woodcraft displayed that must be well worth treasuring up, because a Boy Scout cannot learn too much along these lines. And the first thing Giraffe noticed was the confident way in which the leader started out. Why, he never seemed to bother his head in the least as to what direction the cabin lay in. Giraffe marveled at this very much. He realized that if the task had been left to him, he would have had to cudgel his poor brains to remember all he had been told by Allen, as to the various methods whereby woodsmen know what is north, when in the dense forest, with the sun hidden from sight, and no compass along. So Giraffe amused himself while he strode along as carefully as he knew how. He attempted to picture himself in the role of guide to just such an expedition, starting out to get to the cabin as quickly as possible by taking a shortcut through the woods rather than by following the windings or the river. What would he do first? Oh, yes, there was the bark of the tree to be observed and the fine green moss that grew only on one side, never all the way around. 
he remembered that this moss was said to be almost universally upon the north side of the tree and that if it varied at all it leaned toward the northwest because it was from that quarter most of the severe wintry gales came but trees differ and to his surprise giraffe failed to find this moss in the quantities he had expected evidently then pine trees are in a class by themselves he concluded but there were other ways of finding this out how about the general slant of the trees didn't his instructor assure him that it only needed one glance around for an old traveler through the forest to tell where north was he would notice the slant of the trees and if there were any lying on the ground observe the way they had fallen when overturned by the fierce wind why that ought to be the easiest thing in the world and giraffe was beginning to feel quite proud of the knowledge he possessed when suddenly a very disquieting thought flashed through his head he knew which was north east west and south all right but how was that to tell him where the old cabin lay he might guess that in all probability it was somewhere off to the southeast but that was a pretty big region and the chances of his finding it might be set down as ten against one evidently then something else was needed besides the ability to tell where the north lay in fact giraffe was beginning to realize that a good scout must keep a mental map of the country in his head he may not need a compass one half so much as he has a use for constant wakefulness and the power of observation he should be able under such conditions as these to put a finger on a certain point of the rude chart he draws and say here's where i am right now and there lies the cabin exactly south southeast of me and i can tell where that quarter is as easy as falling off a log the more giraffe got to thinking about this subject the more he felt enthusiastic over it why he had never really understood how intensely interesting it was and then and there the boy determined that he would find out all about it allan knew and allan was only too willing to instruct his fellow scouts in the arts pertaining to woodcraft practical demonstration is worth many times over what a fellow might learn from books take that indian picture writing for instance a boy might read about it and think it rather interesting but when taking part in the game himself puzzling his head over the meaning of the plain pictures of men animals campfire smoke canoes tracks in the dirt and all such things he would discover that is was intensely exciting and liable to be any game of fox and geese he had ever indulged in all this while they were making fair progress on their way sabattis never seemed to swerve once except to avoid some obstacle why he was evidently as positive about his course as giraffe might be when walking along a street in cranford and doubtless the trails of the great pine woods were just as familiar to this dusky son of the wilderness as those streets could be to one who had been born and brought up among them giraffe figured that they must be about halfway to the cabin by now though of course it had to be mere guesswork on his part since he had no means of knowing the facts he did notice that sabattis was growing a little more cautious and also that tad looking around just then as if to see how the others were coming along and catching the eye of step hen put his finger on his lips as if in that way he would warn the greenhorn scouts to exercise additional care it was certainly getting mighty exciting giraffe felt hot and cold by turns but he would not allow himself for one moment to believe that this sensation had anything to do with the quality called fear he gritted his teeth and put on a severe look he would show them if the case came to a point where there must ensue a rough and tumble fight that because he had subscribed to the peace-loving rules of the scouts he could at the same time rise to a special occasion when valor was needed why this feeling was something the same as that which had attacked him when about to fire his first shot at the big black bear allan had described it to him once when telling him how he must overcome the buck egg upon getting his first chance to shoot a deer and giraffe was determined to conquer himself now so that he might not later on feel a tinge of shame when speaking of the way they returned to the cabin bent on capturing the lawless hoboes why there was sabattis bending low now and advancing with redoubled caution they must surely be close upon the cabin perhaps it was even in sight if one cared to raise his head above the tops of the bushes that together with brushwood and dead treetops lay in the way no one could equal giraffe in such a maneuver as this nature had given him the advantage over his fellows when endowing him with that extra long neck and doubtless the shorter davy with his thick neck envied giraffe when he saw how easily the other surmounted difficulties in the way of taking an observation which were bound to prove a barrier to him sure enough giraffe caught a fugitive glimpse of something that looked like the back wall of the old cabin for he saw neither door nor window 
how wonderful that the sagacious penobscot brave could have taken them directly there and so far as he giraffe had noticed without once feeling of the bark of the trees or even sweeping one glance toward the heavens now that the indian and tad had dropped on their knees of course the others were expected to do the same and quickly did they follow suit it must be a part of the game indeed giraffe would have been sorely disappointed had they failed to go through the same experience in all the books he had read of forest trailing and advancing upon an enemy's camp it was absolutely necessary to go the last part of the journey on hands and knees and besides it added vastly to the interest of the thing giraffe thought so they crept along getting gradually nearer and nearer to the cabin so far as could be seen all was quiet around that place just as they had left it in fact if the hoboes had already arrived they certainly gave no sign of their presence perhaps sabattis with his wonderfully trained ear was able to catch slight sounds that would not reach some of the rest of them bunglers at best in the science of woodcraft he seemed to be advancing with perfect confidence and yet at the same time giraffe could not but notice that the dusky skinned main guide always kept his gun in a position for instant use it made giraffe remember what he had once read about the early virginia and new england settlers pious men all of them to be sure but realizing that each was expected to do his part in taking care of home and family giraffe had often repeated the words of their motto to himself and figured out just what it meant to say trust in the lord but keep your powder dry sabattis felt perfect confidence in his ability to reach the wall of the cabin and observe but at the same time he was always ready for accidents but they were now about the end of the little creeping journey for the grim back wall of the trapper's old weather-beaten cabin was at hand one by one the crawlers arrived and ranged themselves as close as they could following the example of the two who had reached the goal first giraffe was immediately conscious of some sort of movement within it was as if a party might be laboring at something that rather tried his muscle for besides the heavy breathing there came a rustling noise and then mutterings give me that piece of wood over there kimball a voice suddenly growled this stone sure beats my time the way she sticks I never thought she was half as heavy. Throw it across to me if you don't want to get up. That's the ticket. Now would you be good, con Sarnia? It gave Giraffe a thrill. He seemed to guess that the speaker must be working at the hearthstone under which the scouts had found all that wonderful plunder. What would happen when he discovered how the package left there was only a false dummy and that the bank loot had been carried off? Before Giraffe could settle this at all in his mind, he heard the man inside give a little shout it's all right kimball i tell you the stuff is here under the stone and just like we left it a year ago they never once suspected the innocents just how near they was to a fortune things is a-taking another turn and i reckon our hard luck's skipped out this knocks a big load off my shoulders believe me kimball end of chapter twenty four Chapter 25 of The Boy Scouts on the Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts on the Trail by Herbert Carter. Chapter 25 Surprising Charlie sabattis was quietly creeping foot by foot along the wall of the cabin giraffe realized that it was the intention of the guide to make his way along the side so as to command the front where the only exit could be found this they must cover if they expected to hold the situation old eli had pushed up alongside the indian he seemed to feel that if it came to a case of holding the hoboes up the desperate rascals would be more apt to surrender if they saw two determined men in the front rank of those who covered them with their guns than if they believed the whole posse to be made up of inexperienced half-grown boy scouts of course this started the others moving also since no one felt like being left behind being close to the wall it was possible for them to hear what was being said within for the two men did not speak in anything bordering on whispers they did not dream of the danger that was hovering over their heads and the findings of the bundle, apparently undisturbed, seemed to make them both happier than they could have been for some time. When they reached the corner of the cabin, the creepers turned it. 
Now they had to remember that the little window was here, and that if one of the new inmates of the hut chanced to thrust his face close up to the wonderful sash that had survived all these years of cold and heat, there was danger that they would be discovered should one of them stray from the wall. Giraffe was listening to what the men were saying. Somehow there seemed to be a sort of strange fascination about playing the part of eavesdropper in a case like this, but he did not allow himself to get so deeply interested as to forget all idea of caution. The man with the great heavy voice, he guessed, must be the leader who went by the name of Charlie Barnes. He, it had been, Tad and Allen had declared, who led the flight of the hobos through the great Maine woods and it had been this fact that seemed to convince the scoutmaster charlie must at one time have been playing the role of guide in these same woods apparently he had not bothered undoing the bundle then for there was no trace of anger or bitter disappointment in his tones such as must have been the case had he learned of the cheat how's the leg kimball he was asking hurts pretty bad let me tell you came the reply and the worst of it is i can't get the bleed to stop if this keeps on, I'll kill over soon. I'm feeling that weak, Charlie. The man with the bass voice said something that sounded like strong language. At first, Giraffe feared he had taken a notion to open up the package and learned of the cheat. But when he spoke, this proved not to be the case. That's hard luck, ain't it, Kimball? He went on. The only feller in our bunch that knows a blame thing about the doctor game. He's gone and took sick hisself, and he's layin' there under that ledge, where we've had to camp out ever since learnin' that them hunters was occupying this here cabin. But after I'm rested a bit, tell you what I'll do. You lay around and take it easy while I hike back and bring my brother-in-law here. He's only a lightweight, and I guess that's how I can carry him on my back. Won't be the fust heavy pack-up toted over the main carries, believe me. All right, Charlie, said the other who possessed a high voice, exactly the opposite of that belonging to the big leader. And perhaps now Dick might be in one of his lucid turns so he could tell me what to do to stop this pesky bleed. I never knowed what a crazy job it was till now not to understand the first thing about stopping blood from flowing from a wound. Sho, sure, that's nothing. I've seen a logger bleed right to death because nobody had any idea how to do the same. You'd think loggers of all men learn such tricks. Likewise, you'd expect sailors would every one of them know how to swim, but they don't in half the cases. Say, Charlie, what we going to do? asked the wounded man fretfully. What do you mean by asking that, Kimball? demanded the other. Supposing I get in trim to move in a day or two, how long must we hang out in these here diggings to take care of Dick? Kimball asked. Well, I want to do the right thing by the poor critter, replied Charlie reflectively. You remembers that he's my wife's brother, but in course there's got to be a limit. We're in danger every minute we stays here this side of the border, and with that thar sheriff poking round every which way trying to locate us, it'd be crazy for us to hang out here long. Put a limit on the time, Charlie. He ain't any relation of mine, you see, and I just don't feel like taking chances on twenty years to oblige your wife's brother. Perhaps I couldn't make it just as well without you. But I know which is north, and that safety lies that way. So I just keep on traveling till I learned I was over the line in Canada. I'll tell you what, Kimball, said the other after a pause. We'll give the poor feller till tomorrow night. If he ain't better then, we just got to leave here by the next morning shore. The best we can do is to fix him comfortable like, with a plenty of water and grub handy, and let him take chances. Now, as I have got my hands on this here bundle of stuff again, I just don't feel like being caged. That's all right, Charlie, replied the other. I don't like to desert a man any more than you do. But what's a fellow going to do? We'd all get caught if we hung out here too long. As it is, we can send the sheriff word when we're safe over the line, and he'll find Dick. They ain't got much on the boy, you know, and if he's sent up at all, it'll only be for a few years. By this time, Giraffe himself was crawling past under the little window. He knew that he must be making more or less of a rustling sound while moving along. To his ears, all trifling things were magnified immensely. Why, he could even hear the pounding of his rapidly beating heart, and wondered if it was calculated to catch the attention of those within the cabin. However, he realized that several things were acting in his favor. In the first place, the wind made more or less of a constant rustle through the tops of the tall pines, and this in itself would have deadened other sounds. Then again, the fact of the two hobo yeggs talking together acted as a buffer, since they were not so likely to keep their ears on the alert for suspicious noises from without. 
There were Sabattis and Eli turning the last angle now. That must bring them to the front of the cabin, where they could crouch down behind some of the shrubbery that Giraffe remembered grew on that side. Doubtless, the keen-witted Indian had this very fact in mind when he chose to pass along to this side of the door rather than take the other route, as Giraffe realized he must have done, simply because in that case he would not have to pass under a window at all. Did they mean to suddenly spring into the cabin and cover the men before they could snatch up their guns? Giraffe hoped not, for in that case the rest of them might not have any share at all in the winding up of the affair, and all the glory would pass to Sabattis, Eli, and perhaps Tad and Allen. But then, the fact that the leaders were now crouching there would seem to indicate that just then, at least, there was no intention of going further. So Giraffe, also pulling his long figure forward, found a place where he too could stretch out, and with his gun in his trembling hands, wait for the next move in the game. Now he remembered what the man with the heavy voice had just said about meaning to start out after the sick member of the trio after he had recovered his wind. That looked as if Sabattis might be laying for him there. And when he stepped into the open, doubtless the two guys expected to suddenly spring to their feet at the same time cowering him by leveling their weapons. Giraffe realized that perhaps this was rather queer business for a Boy Scout to be in, rounding up desperate lawbreakers, but if Tad thought it all right, why, there could be no objection. Someone pushed up against him, and twisting that wonderful neck of his, Giraffe was able to see that it was Step Hen, who in turn had arrived and taken his position in the line. Davy was last of all to reach the shelter of the clump of brushwood, but he came working his way along on his stomach, and pushing his shotgun ahead of him as best as he knew how though the chances were he filled the muzzle with dirt in so doing, and took chances of having a barrel burst should he try and discharge the weapon before cleaning this out. Well, they were all there now, and only waiting for Charlie to be accommodating it enough to put in an appearance. It could not be for long, though, with his nerves all keyed up to concert pitch. Giraffe thought the seconds were weighted down with lead they passed so slowly. There, was that a movement at last within the cabin? Someone was certainly crossing the pine-covered floor with heavy steps. Still, it may have been the wounded man limping to new quarters. Again, Giraffe allowed himself to draw in some of the cool air, for in that second of strain he had actually stopped breathing. The crisis was only delayed a little and was sure to come along before a great while. He realized that those after whom he patterned were taking it calmly, and if they could wait, surely he had no right to show impatience. Many a plan doubtless owed its success to this quality of being able to restrain hasty action. Why, Giraffe remembered a saying to the effect that everything comes to him who waits. Well, there it was again, and this time surely it must be Charlie starting up. The heavy boom of his voice could be heard, showing that he was even then advancing toward the open door. I guess I ought to be back again inside an hour, Kimball. And if so, be you can wait that along, perhaps Dick, he might be in trim to tell you what to do about that leg yarn. Take it as easy as you can while I'm gone, and make up your mind as things is bound to move along art of this as slick as grease, believe me. A bulky figure stepped out of the door. Sabattis waited until he had taken as many as five steps away, his object being to prevent the man from bolting back into the cabin where he could defend himself with some chance of success. Then, as though by some preconcerted signal, the two guides, together with Tad and Allen, suddenly arose and swung their guns to their shoulders. Thinking that this was an invitation for them to get busy, the other three scouts also scrambled to their feet and followed the example of their leaders. And that was the astonishing sight the hobo yeggman saw as he turned his head upon hearing the noise made by the boys in gaining their feet. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of the Boy Scouts on the Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts on the Trail by Herbert Carter. Chapter 26. The Sheriff Gets His Shock, Too. Throw up your hands there, Charlie Bunch, Eli had said in a stern voice and from the fact of his mentioning another name besides that of Barnes, Giraffe realized the old Maine guide must have recognized the Yag Bank burglar as one he had known in long days gone by. 
The big fellow looked ugly for a few seconds, and Giraffe felt a shiver run up and down his spine as he wondered whether he were about to witness a real desperate battle. But then Charlie, for all his fierce looks, had a grain of common sense besides. Doubtless he also knew what kind of man he had to deal with in old Eli Crooks. And then it must have been somewhat discouraging for even the most daring and reckless of souls to see that grim array of seven guns all covering his person, even if five of the lot were held by boys. So Charlie gave a sort of make-believe careless laugh and obeyed the order of the guide. He even thrust his hands up higher than there was any real necessity for doing, as though he believed in going to the limit. Caught at last, and with the goods on, too, he remarked in his booming bass voice. How are you, Eli? So, arter all, I'm going to owe my being passed over to a feller I used to chum with. But we never did get on together, did we, Eli? Say, Kimball, show yourself here. Come out and join in the dance. That's the way it allers goes. When you think things are breaking your way, cur flop, she goes into the soup. Tie me up, Eli, so I can't do any damage when my mad comes on like it will when I gets to thinking of how near I was to being fixed for life. A face was seen in the doorway just then, a frightened face, too. Tad swung his gun around and covered Kimball, who immediately showed new signs of alarm. Don't fire there, he called out. I'm all shot up, and tis I'm losing pints of blood at two forty rate. I surrender all right. If Charlie, he gives in, there ain't no show for a wounded man like me holding out. Keep him covered all the same, Tad, until we get this other one tied up, advised Allen, who possibly knew more about the type of rascal they were dealing with than any other among the scouts. Eli did the job himself, and that he knew how to go about it in the right way Charlie himself testified in no uncertain tones. Reckon that settles my hash all right, he declared as he surveyed the manner in which the stout cord was passed around his arms so as to hold them behind his back when the guide wanted to complete the tying. You'd do for a sheriff, Eli Crooks. I suppose this is just what I ought to expect after playing the kind of game I have all these years, but I don't give up the ship while there's life. Maybe I can get away yet. That was possibly the only thing that had kept Charlie from putting up a desperate resistance when he found himself cornered. So long as there was life, there was hope. Whereas, if he tried to fight and was shot to death, that ended it. Then Tad had a chance to pay attention to Kimball. He saw that there was not the slightest chance for the wounded man to try and escape. He was really too weak to go far, and besides, that open cut did seem to be bleeding seriously. Here, you just sit down and let me look at that leg, Tad ordered, after he had searched the man and taken from him an ugly-looking bulldog revolver that was in exact contrast with the up-to-date automatic weapon they had found in Charlie's pocket, but which he had not dared attempt to reach when faced by the seven foes. Are you a surgeon, boy? demanded Kimball, a note of eagerness in his voice. I hope you are, cause I'm feeling in a desperate way. Unless something's done to stop that flow of blood, why, I'll be a goner before tomorrow morning. Oh, I'll fix that all right, said Tad reassuringly. No, I'm not a surgeon, or only a bungling one at that, but I do know how to stop a wound from bleeding. That's one of the things a Boy Scout learns when he makes up his mind he wants to get a medal and reach out for the first class rank. You watch me and see. There was quite an interested audience for Giraffe, Davy, Step Hen, Allen, and even the two guides hovered around keeping tabs on all that the patrol leader did. Tad first closely examined the mark where the bullet of Sabattis had cut across Kimball's lower limb. Then he took a big red bandana handkerchief and tied it tightly around the leg, just below the knee, making sure that the large knot came exactly on the artery which ran back of the joint. After that, Tad took a stick he had provided, and inserting this in the handkerchief, he began to calmly twist it around several times. Of course, this immediately tightened the binding, and the knot being pressed in against the artery prevented the blood from coming to any extent at all. The man had shut his teeth hard together, but he groaned once or twice under the operation, though Tad believed this must be on account of the strain he was laboring under, rather than because of any particular bodily agony. Now, this is only temporary, the scout advised, after he had washed the wound with some tepid water, for, acting under his directions, Giraffe had hastily placed an old pan with some water in it on the fire, which evidently Charlie had revived after finding his bundle intact under the stone. We're going to make a litter and carry you up to the place we expect to camp tonight, he remarked a little later, when he had bound the man's leg up nicely. And tonight I'll see if I can do something about that partly severed artery. 
It's hardly a job for a boy, and I wouldn't try it, only the case is desperate. And it happens that I used to go around with an uncle of mine who is an old doctor, and he let me help him lots of times. With that, Kimball had to rest content. But the boy had done so splendidly as far as he went that the wounded hobo began to hope he might even go further and fix the artery so that the benumbing bandage could be eased up. At one time, Tad thought of sending one of the guides up and having the canoes brought back to the cabin, but for some reason this plan was abandoned. Giraffe and Davy manufactured the rude litter, acting under the orders of Allen, who had seen one used in the past. It would easily hold Kimball, who was not a heavyweight. Believing that they might as well make use of the strapping big hobo, Charlie, as a burden bearer, Eli unfastened his hands and made him take the front end of the litter while he himself would look after the rear with some of the scouts to keep guard over the prisoner. Of course, in searching the two yeggmen there had been found the proceeds of their recent robbery in the shape of packages of bills and some gold. But when the little procession was ready to leave the cabin and Tad took up the bundle of old clothes which he tossed into the fire, Charlie let out a yell. Hey, that's a crazy thing to do, bub. Don't you know what's wrapped up inside of them same old clothes? He called, evidently greatly excited at the idea of a fortune burning up. I ought to know, because I put it in there myself, replied Tad, smiling at the big man's excitement. You see, Charlie, we began to figure on why you wanted to get into this same old cabin so much, and guessed that you had something hid away here. So we looked around a bit, found the hole under the stone, took out the boodle you had put away, fixed up a dummy to fool you, and there you are. So, let the old stuff go up in smoke. It's just as well to get rid of the duds that nobody wants. Well, I swan, muttered Charlie, staring hard at Tad, as though he had begun to suspect that, after all, these Boy Scouts were worth considering. If many of them could do the things this leader seemed to be capable of, from managing a surprise party on a poor hobo innocent, to fixing up a wounded leg that threatened to do for Kimball. So they went off taking the back trail, and Giraffe, who was observing all these things now, noticed that they passed over exactly the same route as when heading for the cabin. And he gave Sabattis credit for a wonderful amount of ingenuity, which he feared must ever be beyond the capacity of a tenderfoot scout. Of course, it was the intention of Tad to take the litter later on, and acting on the directions which Charlie promised to give, seek the gully where, under a shelf of rock, they would find the sick hobo Dick, who could also be brought to the camp. I rather guess we'll have to break up our trip for a while, Tad remarked to Allen as they walked along in company. Yes, I can see that plain enough, replied the other, because we've had these sick and wounded hobos shoved on us, whether we would or not, and we just can't do anything else. But some of our crowd can go down the river in a big hurry, and after handing them over to the authorities in the first town, come back to you and Sabattis here. I'd want you to stay with me up here, too, Alan, remarked Tad warmly. In due time, they reached the place where the boats lay, and hearing them approaching, Bumpus and Jim came ashore. A camp was next in order, for the boys really wanted to find themselves under canvas once more. Giraffe exerted himself to get a fire going while the tents were being erected, and Tad with Alan had gone off to bring in the sick man. This they had little trouble in doing. Dick was in a bad way, being feverish, and while Tad gave him some medicine, he declared that they had better get the man to a doctor as soon as possible. So it was determined to make an early start. They would be up long before sunrise, the tents stowed and the boats packed. One more in each would crowd a whole lot, but the guides thought it could be done by careful management. Supper was cooked and the prisoners given their share. The wounded man declared he was feeling considerably better, and Dick, too, showed signs of having his high fever broken. The scouts were lying around in any way they considered comfortable, while Charlie and Kimball, with their hands tied behind their backs and a rope holding them to a tree, sat there listening to the conversation, though not in any too happy a mood themselves when there was heard a crash of approaching footsteps. Then several figures loomed up entering the camp. Sabattis had merely glanced up but made no move to reach for his gun, so Giraffe felt that the danger could not be acute. Well, of course, it was no other than Sheriff Green with his posse, and as soon as they advanced, they were holding their guns in such fashion that they had Charlie and Kimball covered, for evidently they had not discovered that the pair were tied up. Run you down at last, have we, Charlie Barnes, the sheriff was saying as he strode forward, and there was a vein of curiosity as well as triumph in his voice. Don't bother getting up. We can put the irons on just as well where you sit. But hello, if here ain't our young friends of scouts. What does this mean, I wonder? 
End of chapter 26. Chapter 27 of the Boy Scouts on the Trail. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Debbie Baker Robinson. The Boy Scouts on the Trail by Herbert Carter. Chapter 27. Down the River. Conclusion. At that, there was a roar from the scouts that must have shown the officer how badly he had deceived himself. But then discovering the two desperate rascals of whom he was in search, apparently sitting there and taking things easy, how was he to know they were prisoners? Besides, he had eyes only for them as he came advancing into camp. A little too late, Mr. Sheriff, remarked Tad, advancing to meet the other. We found that, in self-defense, we just had to take these gentlemen in out of the cold ourselves. Besides, one of them was wounded by Sabattis the other night, and a second is a pretty sick man, so we're going to send them down the river in the morning with part of our force. Of course, the sheriff was greatly disappointed. To have his work cut out for him by a parcel of lads wearing the khaki uniforms of the Boy Scouts was hard on the officer, and Tad felt that Sheriff Green must begrudge them the reward that had been offered for the apprehension of the Yeggmen, and the recovery of the plunder taken from the last bank they had broken into. "'Tell you what we'll do, Mr. Green,' he remarked, as they all sat around the fire, with the three last arrivals enjoying a late supper. "'Suppose we split that reward for the taking of the hobos into three parts. One will go to you, as you gave us valuable information. Another we scouts believe we deserve, while the third I want our guides to share among themselves.' "'That's a generous offer, my boy,' declared the sheriff. "'Most people would think they had a right to it all, as you really do. I accept for myself and Posse and if you can take the wounded and the sick man along in your boats, we'll see that Charlie gets down there all right. Is it a bargain? Tad glanced around at his chums, and each gave him a nod in the affirmative. That settled the matter, for the silent vote had been unanimous. It's a go, sir, and we take you up on that, declared the leader of the scout patrol. Accordingly, they talked over the arrangements, and how they might meet again in the town where the prisoners could be placed in charge of the authorities, until the proper officers came to take them to Augusta. Giraffe managed to get Tad alone later on in the evening. The sheriff was feeling pretty good after his feed, and sat there by the fire swapping stories with old Eli, while the rest of the scouts lay around listening and laughing. I noticed that you didn't say anything about that other pile of stuff we landed under the stone in the old cabin, remarked Giraffe. That's right, I didn't, answered Tad readily, and I kept mum on purpose. In the first place, it was none of their business, because they knew nothing about that plunder, and if they knew that we had it, perhaps it might have made bad feelings. Just remember, and don't mention it. Of course, if Charlie happens to give the secret away later on, when he's with them, that can't be helped. I wouldn't think of denying it if they mentioned the matter right now, but I don't believe it's any of their business. Understand, Giraffe? Sure I do, and let me say I'm of the same mind, too, replied the other. I'll just try and let Bumpus and Step Hen know, because, you see, they're kind of easy marks and apt to talk too much. If that sharp sheriff ever gets a hint of what we dug up, he'll want to hear the whole story. Of course, with an experienced officer to look after Charlie, none of the scouts saw any reason for anxiety or losing sleep in fear of the desperate hobo breaking loose. Tad confined his labors to the sick and wounded. He had managed to accomplish that delicate little surgical job with a fair amount of success, considering his lack of experience. Kimball was loud in his praise of the boy's nimble fingers and ready brain. "'You'll sure be a great surgeon some day, Yonker,' he declared. That was as nice a job as many a doctor could have done, and I reckon I'm going to get well now and stand for that twenty-year sentence the judge will hand out to me. I wish there'd been such a thing as Boy Scouts when I was young. Perhaps then there'd been a different story to tell about me. Tad was sitting there listening to the talk when someone plucked him by the sleeve, and looking up he saw Sabattis. There was a glitter in the black eyes of the dusky guide that surprised the patrol leader. Get gun, come long. Think hear moose call again, whispered the Indian. Tad was, of course, thrilled by this intelligence, but at the same time he remembered that he had promised Alan the next chance in case they had reason to believe a moose were in the vicinity. 
Accordingly, he spoke to the main boy, and then asked the others to kindly moderate their noise, though Sabattis had already told him that they would go fully a mile from the camp before answering the faraway call. Again did Sabattis seem to know where he wanted to wait to see if the moose was to be drawn near the waiting rifles. He settled down at a certain place and sent out the strange call that, heard in the dead silence of the main night, always makes the blood of the hunter leap wildly through his veins. There was an immediate answering call, and after waiting a little time, they once more sent a challenge forth. This was kept up for half an hour, but so far as Tad could see, no advantage had been gained. Sabattis was grunting now every time he called. Perhaps he began to believe this must be a mighty queer moose to send back that rolling defiance and yet not advance to any appreciable extent. No good, Bull he finally declared as they heard the answer come from some distance and in exactly the same quarter as before but if the mountain won't come to mohammed why he might go to the mountain tad suggested in other words chief what's to hinder us from heading that way with you giving him a call every little while he'll either have to run away or face the music then i guess huh just like tad say so bad as ready heap queer never know bull like that soon see as they moved along, following the guide who occasionally sent out a call, Alan took occasion to say to his chum in a whisper, He's some worked up about that answer, Tad, and I saw him shake his head. Come to think of it, I really don't believe it's a moose at all. What's that? exclaimed the patrol leader quickly. Are you trying to tell me Sabattis thinks some other guide is making all that row and trying to call a moose bull to the gun of his employer? Just what I think, and Sabattis does too, replied Alan positively. You keep watching him and see how he acts. This was a staggering idea to Tad. What if it should be the very man I'm wanting to see, to hand him my adopted father's important message, Mr. James W. Carson, he exclaimed. Well, the chances are that's just who it'll turn out to be, replied Alan. As they advanced, the calls became louder. Evidently, they were approaching the place where that mysterious bull moose had taken up his stand and dared the other on to lock horns with him in battle. Presently, Sabattis slung his moose call over his shoulder and called out aloud, How there, Louis! You do em pretty well. Fool me some time, eh? Voices were heard, followed by a loud laugh, and then two men appeared, Tad having thrown on the light of his little electric torch. Is that Mr. Carson? he called out as the other approached. Just who it is, and who may this be? asked the hunter, who had another Indian guide with him, evidently from the same village as Sabattis, for they immediately got together and began talking in their own language. My name's Tad Brewster, and I've been sent up here by my guardian, Mr. Caleb Cushman, with an important communication for you. He tried to get in touch with you at your home, but learned that you had started for your annual winter trip into the woods of the big game country, and might not come out again until spring. Please take this packet then, Mr. Carson, and if there is any answer, I'll carry it back to my guardian. Mr. Carson sat down, and after looking over the important communication that had followed him so strangely into the woods, wrote out an answer which he entrusted to the keeping of the patrol leader. Then he asked many questions and was deeply interested in all that he heard concerning the Silver Fox Patrol of Cranford Troop. I'd like to go back to your camp and make the acquaintance of the rest of the boys, he remarked, as he shook hands with each of the scouts in parting. But all my plans are laid to leave this section at daybreak. My guides are going to take me to where they promise I shall surely get my moose. You were lucky in having a chance at one. We came out here to make a last try, and were hoping our luck had changed when finally an answer came. But both Louis and myself agreed that the bull was the most cautious old animal we had ever met up with. And then, when Sabattis, with whom I have often hunted, called out, it gave us a shock, I'll tell you. So the boys and Sabattis went back to camp, and the others were astonished as well as pleased to know Tad had been able to carry out the wish of his generous guardian, and that they need no longer think of dividing their forces in the morning, leaving Tad, Allen, and Sabattis to continue the search, while the others took the two cripples to the nearest river town below. The night passed without any more exciting incidents, for which the tired boys thought they had reason to be grateful, for of late their sleep had not been as sound as they might have wished, and every one of them had much to make up. And besides, now that Tad had delivered his message to Mr. Carson, his mind was free from worry. With the coming of early dawn, they were astir. Every scout had his particular duty to perform. Two of them stowed the tents away in the smallest compass possible, 
another couple began to pack the canoes, while Tad and Bumpus assisted in getting breakfast, or rather the latter did, for the patrol leader had his hands full in attending to his patients, Dick and Kimball. The sun had hardly appeared above the horizon when they were once more afloat. Again did the merry paddle send the sparkling foam toward the stern of each slender canoe as they headed downstream. Sheriff Green had declared that he would take Charlie about six or seven miles down to a place where he knew he could get the use of a large boat, capable of carrying four men and in this he expected to arrive at civilization not a great many hours after the others did. By changing the cargoes, it was found possible to carry the two extra passengers, especially since neither of them happened to be a large man. The boys were happy as larks as they swept down the river. They laughed, joked, and sang by the hour, because now there was no longer any reason for keeping silence since they were passing out of the big game country. But not near half of our time is up, Giraffe would remark frequently and after we get these two cripples safely landed, why, we mean to make a fresh start. Alan says he'll show us another trail where we can meet up with a new lot of adventures, have some fine hunting, and see more of these great Maine woods. For one, I'm just hoping we'll run up against a pack of them fierce old wolves like we heard howling near our cabin that night. A bear is all well enough, but I've always wanted to bag a wolf the worst kind. Don't you think you're going to run the whole shooting match? remarked Bumpus significantly. There are others, Giraffe. Hello, sounds like Bumpus has changed his mind and feels like he had ought to own a gun of some kind, too, declared Step Hen. That's right, he does, Bumpus hastened to declare boldly. If other Boy Scouts can carry weapons in the woods, I don't see why I hadn't ought to have the same privilege. My folks don't like the IG very much, but then a feller's just got to keep up with the procession. And it'll be the making of me, I guess, if something coaxes me to get out in the woods and walk miles every chance that comes along. Let's look at that fine little gun of yours again, Step Hen. If I only can get one, that's my idea of a clever shooter. And it don't wear a feller's shoulder out either, carrying the same. Glad to hear it, Bumpus, and I reckon you'll be able to afford a gun with all your share of the fat rewards ahead. If you say so, I'll go to the gun store with you and help pick out a good one. You really ought to have an experienced hand along at such a time. Tad and Alan exchanged glances at this remark on the part of Step Hen, for they knew full well that his rifle had been purchased entirely through the advice of the patrol leader. Thank you, Step Hen, Bumpus was heard to say sweetly in reply. I'll be only too glad to have you along, but I've got one important piece of business to look after the minute I get ashore and within reach of a telegraph office. If it busts my pocketbook, I'm sure going to send a wire to our bank cashier and ask him if I did deliver that letter my dad told me was so important. Why, I should think you'd rather send the message to your own house, Giraffe suggested with a wink toward Tad, for the canoes were all close together at the time. Me? exclaimed the stout scout, drawing in a long breath. Well, now, I'd just be afraid to hear the news from headquarters, you know. What if they had lost their lovely home and all because of my stupid forgetfulness? Do you think I could stand it to stay up here weeks longer having fun? No, I've got it all mapped out and know just what I want to say to the cashier. And believe me, I'm hoping for the best, fellers. Have a little pity on me, won't you? We do feel for you, old fellow, said Step Hen, who was drawn toward Bumpus more than ever, on account of this unconscious flattery regarding his new gun. And besides, boy though he was, he could see that the other was really laboring under a heavy strain and actually suffering from the pangs of remorse. What the number of miles might be they covered that day, no one dared even guess. But although they fairly flew at times, owing to the combined work of current and paddles, another night had to be spent on the way. But about noon of the second day, they realized that they were getting on the borders of civilization again. A dog barking was the first sign, and then came the clarion crow of a barnyard rooster. Afterwards, a house appeared, then several more, and far beyond the spire of a church reared itself against the clear heavens. Bumpus looked frightfully pale for him. He knew that the time had come when he might learn the facts as connected with that letter, the disposal of which he had never been able to solve, since the more he tried, the greater became his confusion of ideas. And about the hour of noon, the canoes were turned in toward the shore for they saw the town of Grindstone before them, with the railroad leaning southwest in the direction of the homes that were so far away. Hardly waiting for the landing to be made, Bumpus got ashore and was seen hurrying off into the town. 
They knew that he had in mind the station, where he could send off a hurry message, and Step Hen, receiving a word from Tad, hastened after the fat boy, so as to make sure he did not get into any trouble. Once at the station, Bumpus, who had made a rough draft of what he wanted to wire the cashier, gave it over to the keeping of the agent and asked that it be sent at once. He would sit down and wait for the answer. The clicking of the nimble telegraph key was about the only sound that disturbed the silence in that station, for trains were evidently few and far between on the Aroostook Railroad. It may have been an hour that dragged past, and it may have been much more. Bumpus declared he had aged terribly since coming there, and Step Hen tried all he knew how to keep the other spirits up. There, he's taking a message right now, and it may be for you, Bumpus, he said. A minute later, the operator came toward them, holding out a yellow paper. Here's the answer from Cranford, the telegraph man remarked with a smile, and Bumpus could hardly take the sheet, his hands trembled so terribly. Less than ten minutes later, a very stout youth, clad partly in the uniform of the Boy Scout organization, might have been seen running wildly down toward the river, followed closely by another evidently belonging to the same patrol. And as Bumpus ran, he was waving above his head a yellow sheet of paper, while he let out frequent roars that seemed to be fashioned on one key, and that of joy. "'She's come, fellers,' was the burden of his whoops. "'And I did my duty all right, just like I always said I must have done. He says I delivered the letter that morning when I met him on the street. That makes me happy, and I'm ready to buy the best gun I can get in this town, and stay up in the main woods a whole month if the rest of you want me to.' They did stay some weeks longer and met with a series of strange adventures that some of the boys believed really excelled those that had befallen them in the Penobscot region. What these happenings were, and just how Tad and his five chums acted their parts most manfully in the face of many difficulties, will be found recorded in the pages of the next volume of this series, now published under the title of The Boy Scouts in the Maine Woods, or A New Test for the Silver Fox Patrol. By the way, Bumpus, remarked Tad later as they sat around taking their ease, did the cashier tell you what the nature of that communication was, and did it turn out to be so dreadfully important? Bumpus grew red in the face and grinned. Oh, shucks, I suppose you all have just got to know, he remarked. It was only a line from my dad telling the cashier he had lunch with him that same day and take him out in his new Alco car. You know my dad's the president of the bank, but he's been sick at home for a long time and had to get a car to take him out in the air. But who cares for expenses? Give me two cents worth of ginger snaps. I'm feeling fine right now and can afford to laugh at all my silly worrying. Might have known a scout wouldn't do such a silly thing as to forget an important message. Shucks. Step in, let's go around and see if we can find that gun anywhere. I've got the money to buy it, all right. Of course, the boys understood that the pretended anxiety of Bumpus in connection with trouble coming to his family through carelessness on his part had all been put on. But what he had feared was the reproaches of his father, who had long been trying to cure him of this same fault. The two injured men had been handed over to the proper authorities, and a doctor was even then examining what Tad had done for Kimball. "'You owe this lad a lot of thanks, my friend,' the doctor said. He certainly has done a very neat job in uniting the lips of that artery. I'm afraid you'd have passed in your checks for a certainty, only for the prompt first aid to the injured which you received. And Tad felt amply repaid when he thus learned that, after all, his crude work had not been so clumsy as he had feared at the time. To dispose of the three hobo yeggmen, it might be stated that they were eventually sentenced to various terms in the penitentiary. The reward, which had been increased to $2,000, was paid over to the boys and by them divided just as Tad had proposed, and everybody seemed more than satisfied. But of course, that was only a small part of what was coming the way of the six scouts. Tad soon learned that the bank recently robbed had also offered a reward for the recovery of the bonds that had been taken, and this eventually fell into the treasury of the Silver Fox Patrol. Then there was that other plunder, which had been found under the stone in the old cabin of the trapper, away up the river in the big game country. Doubtless, the plundered bank would be delighted to pay a big sum for the return of those valuable documents, not to mention the cash that had also been recovered. Tad did not have the time just then to open up communications, 
for he wanted to be off with his chums on another trip in a different direction and one that Allan had wished they could take at the time they were compelled to follow on the trail of mr james w carson so tad placed the sealed packet in the safe of a gentleman whom Allan chanced to know right well and who promised to open negotiations with the robbed bank while the scouts were up in the woods i'm pretty sure the gentleman remarked that there is a very nice sum offered in this case and if so you lads are to be congratulated indeed it means a trip out west next summer for our whole patrol and a hunt in the wild rock mountains declared bumpus who was now wearing a perpetual smile because of the good news he had received from cranford and it turned out that they did receive a splendid purse from the bank people who were overjoyed to get back papers that were of tremendous value to them even if of little account to others what this amount was there is really no necessity of telling but it was enough added to all the rest they received to make the six boys the happiest fellows in all the great state of maine and doubtless even before they knew to a certainty just what they were going to receive it can be set down for a fact that they would start out on the second half of their vacation in the maine woods with lighter hearts than they had known for many a day end of chapter twenty seven recording by debbie baker robinson end of the boy scouts on the trail by herbert carter